Hi and welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode we're going to take a look at another repair. This is a Roden Shores AFQ100A. This is an IQ modulation generator. It's a fancy way of saying that this is an arbitrary waveform generator, but it does have some capabilities built into it which make it a very good IQ modulation generator. And this has fairly good specs, about 200 megahertz of instantaneous analog bandwidth and I believe uh, more than 85 dB of spurious free dynamic range, which is great. Another thing I like is that it has differential outputs, something that's often missing in a lot of arbitrary waveform generators, so I really like this uh, because of that. And it's of course also made in Germany. You can see down here at the bottom right. USB interface, and this thing has a built-in PC, so it has its own operating system. It runs Windows embedded its own software, and so therefore it's a really self-contained unit. Then, but you can just all have to do is connect a monitor to it. Now, one of the other reasons I bought a Roden Shores instrument again is I'm trying to build a good ecosystem of Roden Shores equipment here in the lab. I have quite a few. I'm still working on that ZNL6 review. It's coming up. It's a really fantastic instrument. So we'll take a look at that in a, in a different video. But I really want to get this one up and running because I do not have an arbitrary way from generator from Roden Shores, and this would be a good way of getting one. So let's go ahead and see how it behaves. So right now it's in standby. Now, the funny thing is that if I press the power button, absolutely nothing happens and uh, so you know you could suspect that the button is broken or the interface is broken and I was trying to figure it out and if you wait long enough about maybe a minute it actually does turn on on its own but only after you've pressed the button so something is going on with that soft startup circuitry we have to take a look at that it could be inside the power supply we're going to open it up anyway to see what it looks like with a USB port in the front and a various other digital ports it has a whole bunch of ports in the back as well uh, various uh, references and masks and triggers and so on which is quite convenient very powerful unit really all in all. So I'm going to wait until it turns on just so I can show you that it indeed it does do that and then we'll take it apart. And of course just when I want to demonstrate that it does turn on, it doesn't turn on anymore. It could be that the basement is now quite a bit cold than it was before and that may be the reason our heating is being replaced. So the power supply the instrument uses is a Lambda NV175. So as a result this is an off-the-shelf component and therefore we can get the data sheet for it for, uh, fairly simply. This thing can be configured with a variety of different voltage outputs and so on. This is very common from these type of power supplies. So you can see the power supply all cables all go to the other side of the board. There's a whole bunch of circuitry on that side which we can take a look at. We have two fans over here. AC at the input is all turned off right now. And we have a, a hard drive here. The hard drive has this property of Qualcomm. So this instrument must have been in use in one of the Qualcomm laboratories. Now interestingly, there was a sticker on the top cover which said that the instrument is still under calibration until about the middle of 2021, which means that it's also been recently calibrated and therefore must have just been uh, out of commission and just broken recently, essentially. So which is a good sign. It means that it probably works if you can figure out what's wrong with it. Uh, this motherboard over here is totally custom by Roden Shores, as you can see. I don't think I've ever seen one uh, configured like this, but we see some RAM. There's an empty slot for the RAM, so we can always upgrade that. There's an Intel processor under here somewhere. This is probably maybe video card or bridge in the, in the back over there. A few other ICs here, there's a national instrument IC here, it could be GPIB interface, and they use Ethernet cable over here to, to take this Ethernet port to that Ethernet port, and there's even a secondary one. So this motherboard most definitely is, must be used in a variety of instruments that Roden Shorts makes, and it just happens to be in this one. We even see an IDE interface, it looks like, uh, but of course this hard drive is, is SATA. So that should be pretty, pretty easy. Here's the data sheet of the power supply, and we can see all the pinouts over here of this connector, which helps a lot because the auxiliary power supply as well as the soft, spart, uh, soft start ports are listed over here. This I think is called remote on and off. So we can go ahead and turn this on and do some measurement on it based on this and check the health of the power supply. Let's go ahead and do some measurement on this power supply. The very first thing to measure is to make sure the auxiliary power supply, which is the standby power supply, is actually working. It's at 13 and a half volts and based on the pinouts it should be between this pin over here, oops, that's the wrong one, this pin over here, and this pin over here, what do we have? There you go, 13.5 to 5, it's exactly what it should be, and the standby power supply, we kind of expected it to work, that's why we get the front LED port of this thing to turn on, otherwise we would have no power supply at all, and you wouldn't see that LED, which is part of the soft start. Now we also can measure the remote on and off voltage to see if that makes any sense. So I'm going to measure that, that's the second pin, let's see what do we have under. Okay, there you go, interesting. So the remote on and off is sitting at 4.1 volt. Now I'm going to go ahead and press the power on button. Ah, check it out, it went down to almost zero. So 
I believe that the circuitry that's inside the instrument has already requested for the power supply to turn on. But the power supply hasn't turned on even though the request has come in. So this almost certainly is a problem from within the power supply because everything seems to line up. I mean, this doesn't go all the way to ground. I'm not sure if that matters though. And it wasn't exactly at 5 volts neither. So that makes me suspect this thing over here. So we should really take this out and, and find out if there is. It could be actually a bad, as simple as a bad capacitor because these soft spot parts may need some charge of circuitry and so on. That could be one of the reasons it doesn't work. So I say we turn it off. I can just demonstrate this also. If I push the button anymore, nothing happens, of course. But if I cycle the power, so here's a full power cycle down. There you go. It's discharging. I'm going to cycle it back on. You can see it's sitting at 4.18 again, So, which means that it's waiting for the button to be pressed. Press again, does exactly the same thing. Now, this is what I was saying before. After about 30 seconds or so, it actually did come on. So it's not totally broken, but it needs further investigation. So while I was taking it apart, I noticed that discoloration on this connector, this is close to this area over here, which I think is a heat sink. So this thing runs fairly hot, it looks like, when it's operating. And that could explain the strain that it's been experiencing over time. And here's the power supply outside of its chassis. It's a really simple architecture in reality because for these configurable power supplies where you basically tell the manufacturer what you want and they give you the power supply configured to your needs, they're almost always modular. So you can see these modules installed here. And interestingly enough, I think these themselves are actually DC-DC converters inside. So this may be a two-stage power supply where there is a main power supply that generates perhaps some uh, default voltages and they go through some regulations followed by another DC-DC converter. And that gives you some you know, reasonable efficiency while being fairly configurable. I think that's what's going on over here. You can see the main transformer, some input protection, diode, the main bridge here, main capacitor here. Yeah, you know, nothing unusual. The fuse is buried down there, and these potentiometers will be able to adjust various power supplies that come out of here. So I was looking at this, you know, for something fairly obvious, and you know, also interesting to see there are not that many capacitors in this. There's not that, that many output filter capacitors, and that's probably because these DC-DC converter modules themselves are fairly fil filtered, and they come from only a single rectified or maybe two rectified voltages. In a way, I think it reminds me of the Roden Shores power supplies that they have recently released. I have one in the lab here. We'll take a look at that in a, in a later time. They also use multi-stage DC-DC converters. So if you look on the other side, Right off the bat, I noticed that it almost looks like this has been worked on before. So if you look over here, you can see that indeed some work has been done around these capacitors. These ceramic capacitors can fail, of course, and maybe somebody replaced them. Even some of the resistors have been replaced, and there's some flux residue left over here. Huge isolation between the, um, the low voltage, the output, versus the primary side, which is nice to see. Now, this pin over here is the pin responsible for the remote on and off. And if you trace that, it ends up being somewhere around here. That's a little bit consistent with what you would expect. So let me put that in the middle here and zoom in a little bit more. There it is. So we can trace this around and try to reverse engineer this. This is a NAND gate, a quad NAND gate uh, built into it. So the NAND gate is, again, consistent with some kind of a logic to derive the on and off condition of the power supply. This is an NPN transistor, a little bit strange as well, because I would have expected perhaps a MOSFET here. And then there is a for very small resistance in here in series with this, in, in, with the collector. So that almost certainly is responsible for the soft power on portion. So we can try and investigate and see what's going on here. Some of this solder has been retouched and a paint has been applied. This is basically to make the solder mask uh, that was gone in these places back, so the protected traces. That leads me to believe maybe this was done in factory and not afterwards, because I don't think most people go through this trouble when they're fixing something. And I, on the other side, we have some capacitors. It might be worthwhile replacing this capacitor just because it is in the same vicinity just before we start you know, reverse engineering the circuit. Some obvious things can be done. I also looked at these uh, solder. They're not that great, so it might be good to look at them under the microscope as well to see if everything is done correctly. But I think this is a good start. So let me grab the microscope. Okay, let's take a look at this. And it's a good thing that I put it under the microscope because indeed there are some issues that we have to take a look at. So here are the resistors. This is where the signal originally enters the circuit here. Here's our NPN device. We can follow up. And if I go over here in this corner, we can see some capacitors. The soldering is really not that great. But if I look at this one, let me turn this a little bit, and we can refocus on it. And you can clearly see that this is not connected. So this capacitor's cold solder joint. It's terrible. That definitely needs to be fixed. And this is all close to where I suspect the startup circuitry is. So that could explain the intermittent problem. 
we can go over here again is some what appears to be for example this one if I look at this capacitor it very much looks like a cold solder joint there's no reflow to the pad and here's something else you might find interesting these are some spark gaps that are already on the PCB and these are across the two terminals of the input inductor and this is a common place to place them because if you have a surge of current across the inductor you will indeed get a large voltage across the inductor that's the behavior of course of an inductor and this is what these are there for this is basically a poor man's spark gap you can have those specially designed tube filled with a gas that are calibrated for a precise uh, voltage to trigger them and then get the uh, a sudden surge of current to discharge between two points but these are just simply removing the solder mask and getting some pointy uh, the sharp ends of the PCB traces there and that would allow the, the spark to jump between these two points and by changing the distance you can kind of get to the voltage that you want yeah they're nice there's a whole bunch of them on the circuit board okay so here's my debugging setup I went ahead and did all the soldering touch up here I looked all over the place and did a few more that I thought was problematic and the, the issue still was there so I started tracing it out a little bit more first of all I took the power supply out and I soldered all the wires necessary to put it into standby and bring it out of standby manually so I just put the 13 and a half volt down here into a voltage regulator board and created five volts remember you cannot connect a 13 and a half directly to the remote on and off pin because that's a TTL logic level and 13 and a half will destroy the input so I did that and I followed that a little bit and I essentially worked my way through that circuit step by step I saw that the input will trigger the NAND gates over here and the output of the NAND gates switch accordingly which is correct and then that jumps over to the other side of the board and the inhibit signal that gets the clock of the DC DC converter started on this side was going through this optocoupler these two optocouplers over here on the other side of the board you're looking at the traces over here here are the optocouplers and one of them was behaving a little bit strangely I did replace it it didn't really make much of a difference I guess that behavior was normal then I further looked in inside and I, there's a capacitor on this side which appeared to be potentially part of that startup circuitry so I took that capacitor out over here and I measured this one and by the way I took out all the other capacitors and I measured them and they were actually really really good surprising that these guys are running at such a high temperature they must be fairly good quality capacitors so they survived fine and then we had this capacitor over here let's go ahead and measure this one I'm going to use this since it's handy no need to go to the fancy LCR meter here so we can connect that over this over here and over here and what do we get? Well, we get an ESR of more than 40 ohms. So that this capacitor is definitely dead. So this is worth replacing. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. This is a 25 volt, 150 microfarad capacitor. Should be fairly easy to find a replacement for it. So let me put that back in there. And we're going to do some more testing to see if it makes any difference at all. Okay, the capacitor has been replaced. And as always, I have to remind you that when a circuit like this is energized, it is extremely dangerous. Even though it's connected to an isolation transformer, that doesn't really protect you between neutral and ground, of course. So please be very, very careful. And if you don't know how to deal with these things, do not do this kind of work on your own. So let's make, su make sure that the diode, uh, the bridge rectifier is working correctly and putting a charge on the main capacitor. Here it is, 162 volts, which makes sense for North America. It looks good and just to show you that the 13 volts is present we can also make a quick measurement on that so I'll take my ground from here and the 13 volt which is somewhere over here there you go the 13 and a half is there too so right now the power supply is in standby mode I have one of these digital multimeters connected to one of the outputs of the power supply so this is not lit which means the power supply is in standby mode if I go ahead and remove this cable this will force through this resistor to ground the remote on and off signal and check it out it works yep it now turns on and off exactly as it should here's you go I can turn it back off you can see it turns off with no problems at all and then back on again yep I've tried this a few times and it's working just fine and it's interesting to see some of the specifications of this power supplies operation in case you're interested there you go you can read what's happening there so it's burning 12.1 watts right now. The power factor is 0.861. It probably has some power factor correction, but yeah, nothing really unusual. You can see how it is working well, and I can put it in shutdown mode. Here's in shutdown mode. In shutdown mode, it actually still burns about 2 watts, but the power factor is about 0.5. So yeah, it looks good. So now that we have this, we can finally put it back in the instrument and take it a step further and see what happens next.
All right, here we are. It now it turns on properly, and I doubled the RAM anyway. You know, even though it doesn't really do anything, so now it has one gig of memory. And here it is booting up, and unfortunately, it looks like the hard drive is dead. So it does have a one gig of Celeron processors. So it's fairly old, but you can see here it now has a one gig of memory, and indeed, the it just gets stuck on detecting ID drives, so it cannot find the hard drive. So the hard drive is dead, which makes sense why this thing was basically just uh, thrown away. But at the same time. We don't have the image. This thing has to have the original image from the factory in order for us to be able to run it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on eBay and look for an identical hard drive like this one as a replacement. And when I listen to it very carefully, I don't think it even begins to spin. So either the board driving the motor is bad or the motor itself is bad. So we're going to progressively go through those steps and try to see if we can recover this hard drive and then image it into a solid state drive afterwards if that is all successful. Let's do it one step at a time. So while we're here, let's look at the back of the unit. This is where all the power regulation as well as all the analog and digital magic happens here. This entire portion of the board is where the power supply connects to. Lots of DC-DC converters with LEDs indicating various voltages coming out. This wind uh, directing path over here is covered at the top of the chassis. Fan over here brings the air directly over this component over here. It's an interesting thermal solution. It's a fairly expensive piece here to add but I guess this is what was needed to get the thermal solution working. This can over here most likely has the OCXO and the reference underneath it. This piece over here has the front end IQ output. So I'm curious to see what's underneath these, so maybe open them and see. Uh, this is a mystery component. It could actually be the data converter. I'm not quite sure, but I do see a lot of connection from the FPGA directly to this. So this could be our dual data converter. This is a memory over here, which has the expansion to one giga sample, I think, for both channels. And I've taken it out to clean it. So that already has that option, actually. This connector over here connects through this chassis to the other side to the motherboard. So that's how the interaction happens. So the power supply is fed through all of that as well. High density connectors here, these are pressed and not soldered. And this connector over here allows you to connect something here. And this could be during factory testing. I don't see how any other option could fit on top of this. It just could be something for the purposes of the factory. Really nice unit, very German style design, Roden Schwartz style. And so let's open some of these more. I'm curious what they look like. All right, let's take a look inside here and see what this module looks like. And here it is. It's really quite beautiful. And the very first thing to notice is that the differential operation for both the Q channel and the I channel goes through a series of electromechanical relays with resistors. And these are, of course, attenuators. And this is the most expensive way to build this attenuator, especially because each side of the differential output is symmetrically laid out with their own independent relays. But this gives you the highest linearity and an excellent repeatability. And this is why they're most likely doing this in order to preserve this spurious free dynamic range of the Q and the I channels like this. Some additional relays at the output, but you can clearly see that the signal amplitude handling is done at the very end using the relays. And that's where you would want to put the attenuator at the very, very end to preserve not just the spurious free dynamic range, but also the dynamic range in general with respect to the noise. Now, going further back, we can see some amplifier stages that are, again, separate I and Q, driving these two branches independently. Going further back, some more amplifiers and a batch of uh, LC filters uh, here we can see. In a, and these filters are most likely there to eliminate any unwanted spurs or higher frequency content from the output of the DACs themselves. There are some connectors here which are not populated, which is also interesting. I wonder why they are not using this. It looks like there's some potential configuration here for maybe even a transformer in the middle that's not populated. Uh, there are some connectors that are most likely for factory testing. These are two DACs, but these are not the high-speed DACs. These are just analog voltage generators. I think about 14 or 16 analog voltages can come out of these. And these are probably setting all the bias point and gains in various settings of these two channels independently from each other. Going further back again, here's our high-speed DAC. And this DAC is a up to 1.2 giga sample per second, 14-bit, which determines the ultimate performance of this unit. They're all from analog devices. And these actually have heat sinks on top of them that connect to the upper chassis, so they're definitely high-power devices. The rest is exactly symmetric from both sides. Some minor power and filtering and some uh, DC-DC converters potentially on the other side. Now if I flip this, we can see some other components in the back. Nothing unusual, really. Uh, there's a, a row of transistors here for the electromechanical relays on the other side, and a, a few other passives and potentially a couple of other components. Some diagnostics, you can read a lot of analog voltage out of this board to find out how it's behaving under diagnostic conditions. Here's a high-density board-to-board connector. These are fairly high speed, most likely carrying all the JSD interfaces of the two DACs outside of this board. So this is a fully digital interface 
instrument with the different SIRDIs interfacing to the two different DACs. And that means that the component that we saw on the other board with a heatsink on it maybe a high power FPGA, something to aggregate the data out of the memory into this and has all the high speed JSD interfaces built into that. It could also be a custom device, but maybe not because I don't think that's needed. Yeah, so it looks really nice. I think that now that we have an idea of how this works and how it looks on the inside, let's go and see if the hard drive fix is working so we can test the unit. I almost forgot about showing you what's under here. Let's remove that cover. And there it is, check it out. So it actually is not an OCXO that was under the bulge of the cover. It looks like a DRO of some kind. This resonance structure is probably used in conjunction with the rest of the ref reference 10 megahertz reference to create the frequency of the actual data converters. Now it's really important for these data converters to have an extremely clean clock. So the absolute frequency accuracy is not as important as the phase noise because the phase noise directly translates to worse signal to noise and quantization ratio as the jitter on the clock randomizes the ADC noise and brings the floor up and same with the DAX of course. And here we have a TCX, so that's 10 megahertz, that's the main reference of the entire instrument and that is probably closed loop in some, of some kind of a PLL to lock to this DRO and this DRO doesn't really have a very high pull in frequency but it doesn't need to because once you lock it you can divide it and do other things with it but this will give you really really good phase noise and that's probably what this entire structure is doing and then they send the clock through this connector back onto the ADC board that we just saw. Really, really nice uh, PLL structure for ultra high performance data converters. Alright here is our hard drive and we can see in the back there has a little small PCB. No components in the back this really helps mounting and of course protecting the back of this surface and here is an identical one that I picked up uh, from eBay. This one is a working used one. So we can first swap these two PCBs and see if the motor comes back. If not, then we'll have to open the hard drive and switch the platters and it's going to be quite a bit more difficult. But this is the easiest thing to try. And well, check it out. After replacing the hard drive board, I managed to get it to boot, which is fantastic. This was a lucky fix on the hard drive. It could have been a lot worse than that. And here's the main user interface. And you know, it's really basic and I'm directly connected, of course, here to the AFQ 110 and I'm using this NGP800 to power this monitor. This is, by the way, a fantastic power supply. We'll take a look at it later. I'm really impressed. I've been using it for now a couple of days, and it's really, really good. So let's go over here and check this hardware configuration. There we go. You can see that it's been turned on about 103 times, and it's been in continuous operation for 20,000 hours, which is, I think, over 800 days. And that kind of explains the probably the condition of the power supply has been used a lot so I'm glad that that was fixed and out of the way. If I go under software options here what do we see here we do indeed see that we have the digital I IQ output which is great and as well as the way for memory to be one giga sample per second that makes sense because that memory module was indeed in the unit too. Okay this is all great now we can load some waveforms onto it and maybe I should zoom into the screen a little bit more. Okay, let's go ahead and load the waveform in here. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can put a waveform in, you can add impairments to the waveform that inc includes IQ, offset, and so on. These are really useful for testing transmitters because you can find out exactly what the, how the transmitter or the modem deals with various IQ impairments. And this is an equalization you can add, of course, which equalizes the channel. This is, again, normal thing to do. Sometimes the, most modems do this IQ equalization to combat not just the channel of the wireless link itself, but also various imperfections of the transmitter. And then there's the output, which you can configure and turn on and off, various amplitudes, offsets, and so on, which is great. This is a really powerful IQ generator for wireless system testing. So let's go ahead and uh, create a really simple waveform. You can load, oh, there you go, you got test signals in there, okay? So at the clock rate of 300 megahertz, we're generating three megahertz tones. I think that's good. You can generate that signal into the RAM. So I think it puts it back in there. Let's go back here and close this and turn this on. There we go. And then we can turn the output on like that. All right, we got to go to the scope and see how it looks like. And here are the four outputs and look at them. They're beautiful, really nice IQ signals coming out. Sinusoid, these are three megahertz signals. Of course, we need to do detailed measurements to see the performance of the instrument in terms of phase and amplitude and linearity, but visually they look fantastic. Now we can also do some other measurements. Let me actually change this from high resolution to, yeah, it's not high resolution, that's good, that's what I wanted. And by the way, check out the user interface of the Road and Show Scopes, it's beautiful. I mean, it gives you every single detail, block diagram of how the signal is treated, various filters and acquisition settings, this is really, really great. So let's go and see if we can generate something other than just single tones. And I think I can generate a two-tone signal fairly easily. 
So here you go. Let me see if this works. It should be two-tone. There it is. Here's a two-tone signal. And again, looks really nice. We can try to take an FFT of this and see uh, these two tones and see if we see any intermodulation products. Now, the performance of the R should far exceed the performance of the data converter inside the RTO 2064 because the RTO 2064 is a 20 giga sample per second instrument, of course, but this is generating only a 3 megahertz signal. But it would be nice to see the two-tone FFT performance. And here's the FFD of our two-tone, and you can see that we have about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 50 dBc of IM3 therms coming from this instrument. Now, we don't know if this is from the RTO 2064 or from the AFQ 100A. Now, I suspect that this is the RTO's linearity limitation, because remember, this is a 6 gigahertz instrument with a 20 giga sample per second ADC front end, so you wouldn't necessarily measure very, very high IM3 terms on a frequency this low because this instrument is optimized for this broadband 6, 6 gigahertz operation. And I believe that its effective number of bits about 7 or greater during the range of uh, frequency it's supposed to process. But nonetheless, we can take this from the RTO and connect it to a different instrument and see if we can get better IM3 terms and that would then conclude that the RTO is the linearity limitation in this case and the AFQ100A is indeed doing what it's supposed to, because it's supposed to be much better than this number we're measuring here. So let's try something else. And here's the same signal on the ZNL6 in the spectrum analyzer mode, and the same two tones at the same two frequencies, and look at the IM3 products, I mean, it's almost, almost 70 dB down. It's maybe about 68 dB down, so indeed it's a significantly better IM3 response from the front end of the ZNL6. Again, this is a different instrument, it's a spectrum analyzer, of course, a very different operation, but you can see that the performance of the AFQ100 is much better than what we were seeing on the RTO. And that kind of verifies what I was expecting, that the performance of the instrument is going to be good. And I would say that that means that the AFQ100A is working fairly well. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair of the AFQ100A. I'm glad to have this now in the lab as part of the instruments. We can do a lot of wireless testing and therefore full ecosystem within Roden Schwartz going forward. This is great. And as always, thanks to my Patreon supporters. You are the reason why I'm able to purchase some of these instruments and repair them and of course bring you this kind of content that I hope you like. And I'll see you in the comment section.